Good afternoon. It's, uh, it's really wonderful to see this, uh, this big auditorium completely filled to capacity and standing room only. Uh, but before we start the program, I would also like to, uh, uh, to, to suggest that there's an overflow space. If you don't find a comfortable seating here, there's an overflow space where it will be on the flat screen in 819, 8th floor, uh, room 19. Okay. But uh, good afternoon to, uh, to all of you, uh, and welcome to the Department of Earth, Atmospheric and Planetary Sciences here at MIT. I'm Robert Vanderhilst, I'm uh, the head of the department, and, and I would like to welcome everybody here, uh, not only those uh, who were in the previous uh, presentation, uh, but also those of you, of course, who have joined us, especially for uh, the lecture that you're going to hear today. And also those of you watching it at home on the webcast and, uh, you know, at home and all over the world. In addition to the speakers that I will introduce in a second, um, I would like to extend a special welcome also to uh, Eric Hobruch, as the vice rector, the vice president of the Université de Liège. I'm very glad that you could uh, make it here, and I'm sure you're very proud of what's happening in your de department, and uh, it's wonderful to have you here. I also extend a warm welcome to uh, Patrick Cornelissen, the consul of Belgium, uh, based here in, uh, in Boston from, uh, from Turnhout, actually in Belgium, welcome. Dean of the School of Science, Michael Sipser is here. Um, there's many other illuminaries, uh, members of our visiting committee of the department. I'm not going to introduce you uh, to them now uh, because we have a lot of exciting things to talk about this afternoon. I'm sure you all share our excitement here at MIT uh, and in the scientific community um, and also all over the world, in fact. Um, I don't think in the United States and in Europe you could have opened the newspapers without seeing front page, uh, you know, the, the seven little planets. Uh, by looking at these pictures, it makes you believe that we know everything about these planets and that we always, almost are um, already familiar with them. Uh, but actually, yes, if you look at the data that, uh, that they're used to discover them, and I'm sure they're going to talk about them, they're just little specks. Uh, but it's still very exciting, of course, to, uh, to see this discovery. Um, we are very fortunate here that we have Professor Michael Gillon from the University of Liège here. Uh, Michael and also Julien and uh, Sarah Seeger, uh, they were at the press conference uh, just two days ago uh, announcing the NASA news. And it's really a great honor for us and a great fortitude uh, to have you here um, later. Um, also, Julien de Witt, of course, from our own department. Uh, I've known Julien for, for many years here, and it's really wonderful to uh, have you seen involved in this and very excited about what's going on. And uh, you said this was going to be big, and uh, you did not disappoint, and it's going to be big. So I'm really looking forward to, uh, to the next hour. Uh, Michael Gillon, he's an astronomer and a research scientist in the Star Institute at the Université de Liège in Belgium. His main scientific interest and passion um, is the search for extraterrestrial life around other stars. After obtaining degrees in biochemistry and astrophysics in Liège, he defended his PhD thesis on the improvement of photometry in the exoplanetary transits in 2006. As a postdoc in Geneva, he performed the first detection of a transit of a Neptune-sized exoplanet, and he's been working on exoplanet detection and their physiochemical characterization since 2009. As a principal investigator for the TRAPPIST project, he has been involved in the detection of more than 100 exoplanets, and since 2012, he has been the principal investigator on the Speculoos project, exploring the nearest and smallest stars in the search for habitable planets. Julien de Witt is a postdoctoral research scientist at MIT who graduated from the universities of Liège and Toulouse and obtained his PhD degree here in, the, in our department uh, under the supervision of Sarah Seeger, uh, another pioneer of exoplanet research. And I'm very happy to say that Sarah is also in the room here. Sarah, where are you? There's so many people all the way in the back. I think we need a telescope to see you there, Sarah. <laughs> Sarah, wonderful that you're here. Um, Julien is currently playing an a critical role in the TRAPPIST and the uh, surges, um, and notably he's leading the atmospheric characterization of the TRAPPIST planets with the Hubble Space Telescope. And we very much look forward to hearing from both of you uh, for the next, take whatever time you want. I mean, this is so exciting, <laughs> but probably the next uh, 45 minutes. Afterwards, there will be Q&A, of course. I hope you agree to doing that. 
And then uh, at about 5.30 or so, uh, we can all go to the ninth floor uh, where there's an informal reception waiting for us and then we can continue to engage and, uh, you know, with the speakers and have a great afternoon. Miguel, Julian. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So I'm glad to be here today to talk to you about uh, this very exciting results. And uh, it has been a crazy week for me and for my colleagues. Uh, two days ago, we were, in, we were indeed in uh, DC to, uh, to present the result of a work that has been ongoing since six years now. Um, you can see here uh, Julia and also my colleague, uh, Emmanuel Joy, who is also playing a key role in the discovery, and Sarah Seeger also. And what we presented, as you know, is the detection of seven Earth-sized planets orbiting a very nearby star, and with a very uh, large promise for uh, detailed study and maybe search for life. So let me explain you uh, very shortly how we detected these uh, objects. It can be shown in this video here. <laughs> so we. We used a telescope, and we were observing this star, and then we saw something. We saw a, a signal that was very interesting. So we, we stayed on the same star, and we kept on observing, and more and more signals were coming. More and more interesting things happened. <laughs> and at some point, we could not believe what we had, and we were completely amazed. And we had just to make party, to celebrate, and to try to believe what we had. And I'm still not really realizing or interesting in this system. And now I'm going to put this discovery into the context, on, into its proper context, and first um, explain you what is the question behind uh, all this uh, project and this, this uh, interesting result. So the question I always had in mind since I'm a kid is, is there someone or at least something else uh, in space uh, out there, or is our pale blue dot unique in the universe. And our world uh, is not only a planet, it is a planet that arbors what is called a biosphere, so a very complex system of, um, of living creatures that are interacting with the environment. And you can see this as an illustration of the biosphere. You see, the, you see here the activity of the photosynthesis. It's level as, as a function of the color. The greener it is, the more photosynthesis you have on, on the map of the world. So it's a good illustration of what is really the Earth. It's not just a planet. If we look in our solar system, so around our star, the sun, we have more worlds, more planets. We have further from the sun, we have the giant planets, the biggest being Jupiter. And you have smaller here, Uranus, Neptune, Saturn with its nice rings. And you have closer to the sun, you have the terrestrial planets, including, of course, our Earths. So these tiny planets compared to Jupiter, for instance, are very interesting and also very different from each other. So you have the Earth with its nice biosphere. You have its twin, Venus, same size, more or less, same mass, and still it is completely hellish uh, 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 place with its uh, large greenhouse due to its very dense CO2 atmosphere. Its surface conditions have a very high temperature, 700 Kelvin, and a very acidic uh, um, rains and so on. So you don't want to go there in, uh, in vacation. Then you have Mercury, a tiny ball of rock which is burned by the sun. Certainly not a very pleasant place, Afer. And you have the red Mars. So, we astronomers want to search for life uh, in the universe. We have to define some uh, theoretical concept. And the one that we use, uh, that we use often, is the one of habitable zone. So the habitable zone is uh, defined based on a simple theoretical assumption as a range of distances to the sun, which is here shown, uh, for which you could have liquid water on the surface of a planet, of a rocky planet because liquid water is a primordial ingredient for life as we know it, and we want to search for life, well, as we know. We, we can imagine other forms of life, but first, let's stick to what we know. And if you look at our solar system, you have Venus, which is at the inner edge of the habitable zone, and still not very habitable at all. Of course, you have the Earth, and you have Mars, 
So Mars has been in the imagination of astronomers and of science fiction writers, writers as a place which would be suitable for life during two decades, two, two centuries, sorry. But now we know that Mars is just a big ball of rock with a very thin atmosphere and very harsh surface conditions which are not at all suitable for uh, life. So if we look at what, in our solar system, the only planet in which we have habitable conditions is the Earth. So if we want to search for extraterrestrial life and complex biosphere like ours, we have to turn to the stars. You have here a nice image of what is called the Milky Way, which is our galaxy. This is the kind of image you can have in a place which is not Belgium, when you can see the sky. Here, apparently, it's in the mountains. And this galaxy is a very uh, big structure, 100,000 light years uh, in diameter. It is a disk, which is composed mainly of gas and dust and plenty, plenty, plenty of stars. 300 billion stars among them, a very normal star called the Sun, where we are and uh, orbiting around. And this makes a lot of places to search for life. This is our local universe. There are plenty of galaxies, but we have to stick to this one because the others are much, much far away. We can't hope to study uh, exoplanets and, uh, around, uh, in other galaxies. So we have to focus on extrasolar planets, which are possibly in our galaxy. And the first step, if you want to study them and search for life, we have, of course, to focus first on the detection. And it's not so easy. It took decades and even centuries of effort to be able to detect exoplanets. Uh, already Isaac Newton considered possible, maybe, that exoplanets existed, but he could not detect them, of course, at that time. It took a lot of efforts. And finally, in, 2000, in sorry, 1995, these two fellows here, these two Swiss guys, Michel Mayor and uh, his student at that time, Didier Quellos, detected the first exoplanet around a nearby solar-type star. Not at all a pleasant place for life. It is a Jupiter planet, Jupiter-like planet in a very short period orbit. This is an artistic view of this, what is called hot Jupiter. But still, it was a major leap towards the study of habitable planets outside our solar system. And the field has been ongoing at a crazy uh, rate since this detection. You have here an histogram which is showing the number of detections as a function of the year. So you, you, you don't see, in fact, the first detection here, one. Then it went on, went on, many, many projects, many, many efforts ongoing to detect more and more planets, smaller and smaller planets. And at the end, the effort paid, and we, had, we have now more than 3,000 planets known orbiting other stars. And even some of them, we, for some of them, we could have some image. When I say image, it's not uh, being able to see the surface and seeing, uh, I don't know, volcanoes and uh, continents and so on. We just have a dot of light that we can separate from the light of the star, which is extremely difficult already because the stars are so far. It's, much, it's easy to see a planet in the solar system, but the star being so far, you can't do it easily uh, for an exoplanet. So you have here these three dots of light here, which were detected around the star, which is here hidden by an optical device called a coronagraph that allows to see these uh, three planets. So it was also a, a big first. Now, if we consider among these 3,000 exoplanets, the ones that are possibly well suited for life as we know it, we have a very small catalog of potentially habitable planets. This one was updated recently with the TRAPPIST-1 planets. You have here the 10 planets that were known at the beginning of the week that could have potential uh, habitable condition. And for these planets, we know nothing, in fact. We just know all the mass, all the radius, and we have no possibility to study them in detail because it's very difficult to study a planet. Detecting, detecting a planet is already something, but studying it in detail and its atmospheric condition, it's super difficult. Let's see this. So, if you want to characterize an exoplanet, study its atmosphere, you have to do a thing which is called spectroscopy. You have to take the light of the planet, paste it in, sorry, Place it in a diffractive element like a prism, 
and it will be separated in different colors, in different wavelengths. And this, uh, this different wavelength will contain information about the uh, composition of the medium in which the light paced, uh, paced in two. So this is shown here as what are called lines, which indicate the, the atmospheric composition of the star itself here, or the planet. And to illustrate this, these are real data. This is the spectrum of the sun. And you can see plenty of structures, which are kind of fingerprints, which uh, tells us the different elements which are in the atmosphere of our sun. And you, could, you can do this for an exoplanet too, or a planet. And this is an illustration of this. You have here the three terrestrial planets, Venus, Earth, and Mars. You have here the wavelength. It is in the mid-infrared, so in an infrared, uh, in, a, in a wavelength range, which we are not sensitive to with our eyes. And you see the variation of the brightness as measured as a function of the, the wavelength, the color. So here for Venus, we have a big peak here, a big structure due to the presence of CO2 in its atmosphere. We also have this for Mars, but you see that for Earth, we have other structures, which are very interesting from a biological point of view because they are related to molecules that we know are very important to uh, the metabolism of organism. And there is O3 ozone, which is a byproduct of the O2 uh, photolysis, and you have water, which is essential to life. So from this spectrum, if we could do this for an exoplanet, we could conclude there is something going on on this blue planet, and that it's very well, uh, that it's very likely that this is uh, life, activity of photosynthesis creating these different uh, abundances and atmospheric composition. So the way to, uh, to do this for exoplanets is to focus on a wavelength range that is full of information on the different molecules in the atmosphere of the planets, and it is the infrared which is the best suited for, for what we know, and to get this kind of data. And so it's very easy, in theory. You take the light of the exoplanet, you pass it in a diffractive element, and you get the spectrum. But this is, in fact, not so easy in practice. In practice, as the planets are very faint objects and very far from us, they are like a, a, a firefly, a very faint source of light that you could barely see. You need a very big telescope to see this source of light. But furthermore, they are very close to something that is extremely luminous, which is called a star. It's a star. And it's a star is like a lighthouse. When you turn it on, it completely uh, dilutes the signal from the planet. And from a technological point of view, to be able to see the firefly here is really, really difficult. And there's still a lot, there's a lot of development ongoing to do this for exoplanets. As I've told you, there have been first results, but we are, very, we are quite far from uh, doing, being able to do this for Earth-like planets. Here, the, the detection, for instance, of these three uh, planets uh, concern a star which is very young. So the, the planets are still very young, very hot, very bloated. Uh, they are very far from the star, and they are very massive, too. These objects are a few Jupiter masses, not at all Earth-like. So there's still technological development, which are ongoing, uh, to be able to go to make this quantum leap towards uh, the direct detection of Earth-like planets. And I know, for instance, that Professor Sigur here is working on this. And it will happen, eventually. But on my side, I don't like to wait, and I would like to see first result before I'm retired, so I want a shortcut. And the shortcut is given by the transits. So the transiting configuration of an object uh, is simply uh, saying that a, an object is spacing in front of a, another, from a, a celestial object which is partially occulted by another object. And we can see this in our solar system. So here you have an actual transit of Venus, uh, Mercury, sorry, in front of the sun, or Venus because these two planets are uh, orbiting closer to the sun than the Earth, and we are, all the planets are more or less in the same plane, which is called the ecliptic, you can see from Earth, from time to time, one of these two planets passing in front of the sun. So this is a transiting object here. Does someone know what it is? Yes, good. 
you're listening, it's good. So what we can do for exoplanet is not to, to have this kind of images. We can't resolve the disk of a star and see the planet. But what we can do is measure the brightness. And when the planet passes in front of the star, you have the brightness that, that, uh, that is dimming, that is a bit uh, lower. So this is the evolution of the, the brightness of the star as a function of time. We call this a light curve in astronomy. And you see this drop of brightness indicates that an object is passing in front of the star. And so this transit light curve allows us to detect planets, to detect any planet for which we are precise enough to measure this kind of drop. But furthermore, it's not only a tool for detection, it's also a tool for characterization, detailed study. The, the transit depth, the, the depth of the signal here, really depends on the size of the planet, because the bigger the planet, of course, the more uh, the star is hidden behind it. And so the, 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 the larger the amplitude of this transit depth. So we can constrain the size of the planet. We can also, using uh, different techniques, measure the mass, the absolute mass of the planet. When you have the mass and the size, you have the density, and so you can, uh, you can derive, or at least you can constrain its composition. Is it more rocky or more gaseous? Of course, a, a planet like Jupiter has a lower density than a rocky planet like the Earth. So you can say something about its composition. By the periodicity of the signal, you can constrain the orbit, and also with different methods, you can really constrain the shape of the orbit and so on. But you can also study the atmosphere. And here the atmosphere is represented by this thin annulus here. And this is one we want to study without seeing it, without having any image of it. And to do this, we rely on a, on a technique which is called the transmission spectroscopy. So when the planet passes in front of the star during the transit, we have this thin annulus that passes in front of it. And so a, a very small fraction of the light of the star will be filtrated by the atmosphere. And this, this filtration, this uh, modification, will uh, inform us about the composition, will depend on the composition of the atmosphere of the planet. So by comparing measurement of the, spectra, or the spectrum sorry, of the star during the transit and before or after, you will see some alteration due to the atmosphere of the planet. And through this method, you can get very detail in theory, very detail uh, uh, constraint on the atmospheric composition of the planet. And this technique has been applied to giant planets, many giant planets, with success from the ground and also uh, with the Hubble Space Telescope and uh, also Spitzer Space Telescope. And so the goal would be to apply this to transiting potentially habitable Earth-sized planet and search in the spectrum of the, of the planet, the transmission spectrum, signs of different molecules, be able to constrain the, the surface condition and maybe s detect biological molecules, or at least of molecules related to biology, which are called biosignature. So if we look at the transiting planets in my small catalog of, uh, of potentially habitable exoplanets, we have four of them detected by the Kepler Space Mission. But unfortunately, with current technology, we can't study this planet. And the reason is that these planets are so, so small compared to the star. The fraction of light that is filtrate, filtrated by the, by, uh, by the atmosphere is so negligible compared to the, to the amount of light that is not filtrated by the atmosphere that you can't detect anything with current technology. This is the size of an Earth-sized planet. This is an Earth-sized planet at scale uh, with a solar-type star. It is 100 times smaller in, uh, in radius, in area, it is 10,000 times. And the, the atmosphere is just a thin annulus around this planet. So it's super, super difficult. In fact, it's impossible with current technology. So the shortcut, uh, the trick, I would say, to do this now is to go to smaller star. You take an Earth, you put it in front of the smallest possible kind of stars, and you get a signal which is boosted by a factor 100. Just because you have a, small, a star which is 10 times smaller, the area is 100 times larger, and then you get this boost of signal. And these super tiny stars are very frequent in our galaxy. They are called ultra-cool dwarf stars. 
Uh, these are stars that are much cooler than the sun, uh, much less massive. We are talking about 8%, 9% of the mass of the sun. Their size is similar to the one of Jupiter, so 10 times smaller than the one of the sun. And these stars are so uh, cool and low, low mass, they have a low mass, that in their core, the nuclear fusion, that are the, the characteristic of stars, are, are going very slowly. So the lifetime is nearly forever. It, we are talking about 1,000 uh, billion years, at least, of lifetime. So when the sun will be gone, since a long time, these stars will still be there, and very young, in fact. And furthermore, they are mostly unexplored for exoplanets. So now if we look at this theoretical concept of habitable zone, we see that it strongly depends on the, on the mass and the size and the temperature of the star. So you have here the, the temperature of different stars, and here you have the distance to the star. And so the, the cooler the star, a normal star, in fact, the, the, least, the less massive it is, the smaller it is. And so you see that these ultra-cool dwarf stars, which are here, in fact, just at the bottom, the habitable zone, which is quite far from the sun, huh? you see the Earth here at uh, nearly the inner edge of the habitable zone, it's super close to the star for these ultra-cool dwarf stars, which means that we are talking no more of orbital period of one year. We are talking about orbital period of a few days, which makes life much more easy when you want to study transits. So the signal is coming over and over again. And furthermore, because they are so close, the probability that the transit, that you have a transiting configuration is enlarged, is, uh, is boosted compared to a, a, an Earth in front of a Sun-like star. We're talking still about a few percent, but this means that if you observe enough stars, a few hundreds of stars at least, uh, for an Earth-like Earth planet in front of the Sun, you're not sure to get a transit because the probability is below 1%. If we go to these tiny stars, you don't have to even to observe 100 stars. Let's say 100 stars should be enough to detect a system. So now the context of, this, uh, of our project is that uh, many transit uh, exoplanet surveys have been ongoing during the last decade. The first transit of exoplanet was discovered in 2000. And since then, many projects have come. And I will think especially about Kepler, which is a NASA mission that is still ongoing, that has detected uh, more than 2,000 exoplanets. So very, very successful. There is the Coro mission also, another, another mission which was kind of pioneer mission from space. They are coming two, two missions, one European Kiops and one uh, uh, American TESS. Uh, in which MIT is strongly involved, and they should detect plenty of very interesting systems. And also, there are ground-based searches, uh, like uh, MRF, WASP, and so on. There are plenty of them. But unfortunately, none of them is optimized for ultra-cool dwarfs. Most of them um, focus on stars like our sun, uh, Maybe because we are, it's a kind of anthropocentric uh, uh, bias, we want to, to understand the planetary population of stars like ours. Uh, and also, uh, some are focused on smaller stars, but none of these ultra cool dwarf stars. So the concept of our project is to go there, to go in this niche, to go uh, searching for planets around these uh, ultra-cool stars. So our first move was to get a name for the project. <laughs> and we decided to go, again, to go for a typically Belgian name, which is Speculoos, which relates to a cookie, which is uh, famous in our country. So it is the acronym, far-fetched acronym, of Search for Habitable Planets Eclipsing Ultra-Cool Stars. But uh, speculos, uh, because these ultra-cool stars are quite uh, faint, even if they are very nearby, you don't see them, see them by high. Even if one was entering in our solar system, uh, the limit of the solar system is about one light here, you wouldn't see it by high. You would see it when it'd be quite close, in fact, because they are so faint, so cool. So you need quite a big telescope to be able to search for transits. So before asking for a lot of money, we wanted to make a prototype to be sure that these stars were not uh, bad targets to search for planets. So we made our prototype with our telescope TRAPPIST, which is also a typically Belgian name. 
which again far-fetched acronym, okay? Transiting Planets Planetary Mars Mars Telescope. It is in uh, in Chile, and we use it to observe transits of exoplanets and also observe comets, which are related to planetary formation. And we decided to use a part of its time to look at the to monitor the nearest ultra cool dwarfs visible from the southern hemisphere, and see if we could detect something with with it. We were just assessing the feasibility of the concept of speculos. So here is a site where uh, TRAPPIST is located. It is in, in the Atacama Desert, which is the driest site on Earth. So you can see there's no tree, uh, no, nearly no life, except a few astronomers lost in the mountain here. <laughs> and TRAPPIST, among all of his big telescopes, is these tiny things here. But with a tiny thing, you can still do quite uh, nice things like detesting, detecting last year this, the free first planet around TRAPPIST-1. TRAPPIST-1 was among the, uh, the 50 targets of this uh, prototype survey. And we observed it the first time in 2013 for one night. And then it was lost in our scheduling program. And uh, we reobserved it in uh, 2015. And uh, in 2015, we saw that there was a signal that was looking very much like a transit. So we intensify our observation. And at the end, we got three signals which were originating clearly from three different objects. Let me first talk to you about the star. As I told you, it's an ultra cool dwarf, so it's super small. So it is here compared to the sun in size. It is 12% the, the, the size of the sun. Its mass is 8% the mass of the sun. So it's really, really a small uh, and tiny thing compared to the sun. You have here Jupiter compared in size to TRAPPIST-1. You see it's not much smaller. And it is only at 40 light years. So 40 light years is far if you go there by bike, but at the scale of the galaxy, it's super, super close. And it is, in fact, one of the smaller stars of the solar neighborhood. And these are the signals that we detected in our data. So what you see here are these famous transit-like curves, so drop of brightness, obtained with different instruments, because we were not really believing TRAPPIST uh, when it was showing us so many transits, so we decided to observe with other instruments. And fortunately, the transits were there. Even with an uh, eight-meter telescope like the VLT, it was there. And we had the, the certainty that there were at least three planets orbiting uh, this star. And these three planets, because of, we know the size of the star, and we, because of the depth of the transit, we know their size, and they are more or less Earth-sized. So now if we look at them, at their orbit, compared to the habitable zone of the star, uh, we see that they are very close to the habitable zone. And so we, call, we can call them temperate. They are not hot, baked planets. They are planets that are cold enough, or at least uh, which have uh, an irradiation which is low enough to make possible liquid water on a fraction, at least, of their surface. So B and C are not in the habitable zone, but still could have some liquid water. I will explain uh, after. And for D, we had only two transits. So we were not really sure of its orbit, of its orbital period, because when we observe from the ground, we have gaps. We observe during a few hours during the night, then we have to, to wait for a second night and so on. We have different sites, but even there the weather can be forecast and so on. So you never have a continuous observation. So you can have some ambiguity in your detection, especially with, when you have only two transits. Well, we were still a bit frustrated because there's no planet in the habitable zone here. So we are searching for planets, especially in the habitable zone, because they could be more likely to have liquid water. So TRAPPIST-1, B, and C were still interesting from a, let's say, biological point of view, astrobiological point of view, because it was still possible they had some liquid water for, uh, under some models. So these models are called eyeball planets model. The planets are so close to the star that they have to be what is called tidally locked. Uh, tidal locking is very easy to illustrate. You just have to look at the, the moon. The moon is always facing the Earth with the same face. It is due to the tidal interaction, uh, to the tidal uh, influence of, of the Earth. And here it is the same for the planets. The, they are so close to the stars that the, the, stars, uh, the star has forced them to always keep the, face, the same face towards them. And so they are trapped in this, what is called a, a, a tidal-looking uh, state. 
And so you should have a, a phase which is always irradiated and a phase which is always in uh, day, uh, in night, uh, night time. And if the atmosphere is thin enough and uh, dry enough, you could have a phase which is completely scorched and uh, really desert with no habitable condition, uh, an, an, a night phase which is uh, very cool and on which where you would have the few, uh, the, well, the, the, a few water which is freezing and making a kind of big uh, crust of ice. And in between, you would have the, the ice that melt at the limit, what is called a terminator, and you could have some liquid water there. So this is certainly not a place I would like to live on, but it's a possibility for liquid water. Then we had new data. And uh, first of all, we had very exciting data that we obtained with a very large telescope, which is an, an ESO telescope in Chile. In fact, the second, of the, transit, the second transit of the planet D, the outer planet, for which we were not sure of the orbit, showed us something very, very interesting. So this is the light curve. And you can see that compared to the light curve I showed you before, it has a very peculiar shape. And in fact, what we, what we see here is something is passing in front of the star. And it is not the same thing than here, because here you can see clearly two things that are uh, uh, crossing the, the star and going out of the disk of the star. And there's still a third uh, um, uh, up, up, uprise of the flux here. And in fact, the only way to model this like Earth is to, is to assume that you have three planets pacing in front of the star at the same time. One of them was the inner planet Trappist-1c, so uh, the second innermost planet. We knew it was passing, but clearly there were two objects here passing. So we got the certainty when anal analyzing this data that there were no three planets, there were at least four planets. So we decided to intensify our observation of the system. And for, first of all, we started from the ground with, by using a large network of uh, ground-based telescope, including, of course, our TRAPPIST telescope. So we have TRAPPIST, which is in La Silla, which is called TRAPPIST South in Chile. We have now a new one installed in Ukai Medan in Morocco, which has been observing intensively also TRAPPIST-1 this year, uh, last year, the Liverpool telescope and other telescopes. And we got plenty of transits, new transit, clearly not from planet B, clearly not from planet C, and clearly not from the planet D we thought we had discovered. So at the end, we had so many transits, we could not make sense of this. And we were really puzzled. And we, we concluded that the only way to make sense of this, to solve the system, was to observe continuously during at least three weeks uh, from space with very high precision to really see what was going on. And fortunately, uh, there is another facility, which is called the Spitzer Space Telescope, which can do it, observe continuously a star for weeks. So we used Spitzer in fall to observe the star for three weeks in a row. We tried to complete the few gaps which were due to data downlink uh, from the ground. So you can see here the measurement of the brightness of the, of the star as a function of the, the date. And you can see that there are drops. Blop, blop, blop. And you have plenty of drops. In fact, we counted 34 drops of brightness. And well, we couldn't believe this uh, because we were expecting, yes, some drops because there were clearly more planets, but not so many. And at the end, the only way to make sense of this is to assume that there were seven planets. And so we tried every possible combination with our ground-based data, and they were in perfect agreement with this hypothesis of seven planets. At the end, this was the only possible conclusion, the only way to explain all these data. Uh, by the way, you see here a small one, two uh, increase of brightness. This is not an anti-transit or something like this. It is just a star that is expressing its behavior and having what is called a flare. So it's a, it is a kind of uh, chromospheric explosion on the surface of the, on the, of the star. And so it completely uh, uh, changed our understanding of the system. Uh, at the end, we were not with two, three, or four planets, but seven planets, all of them having more or less the size of the Earth. So you see now uh, our view of the system. You have here TRAPPIST-1, B, Trappist B, C, D, EFG, which are in the habitable zone. D is very close to the inner uh, edge of the habitable zone. Uh, D and E are smaller. No, D is smaller 
and then the Earth, E also, and there is an outer planet here, H, which is also quite smaller than the, the Earth. And if you compare this system to the system, to the solar system, to the terrestrial planets of the solar system, you see that it's quite, it's richer in uh, terrestrial planets. We have four, here there are seven, but it's also a much more compact system because here, uh, this is not shown, but uh, here it is enlarged by a factor 25. Everything is going on here in an, in an area which is much closer uh, to the stars and the orbit of Mercury. So these planets are really, really close to the star. But because the star is so small and cool, the irradiation, the level of light they receive from the star is similar to the one of the Earth, uh, Venus, and uh, the terrestrial planet of our solar system. It's a kind of analog, of mini analog of our terrestrial solar system. And the seven could, in fact, have some surface liquid water. If you play with the different assumption of the atmospheric properties, we have no idea of the atmospheric properties, but if you play with the assumption, you can find some uh, combinations that shows that they could have some liquid water. So what's next now? We have this system, what we want to do? Well, first of all, we want more. We want more system like this, and then we want to characterize them, because this is the whole concept, not just finding planets and having statistics and numbers, but really to make detailed characterization and make exoplanetology, so being able to really to constrain the sizes, the masses, but also the composition, the atmospheric composition, the surface conditions, the habitability, and so on, and make, really enter the field into a new era. So we, of course, want to find more planets around Trappist-1 Trappist itself, at least to try. It's possible, because if there are seven, why not eight, nine, ten? Well, I don't know where is the limit to the number of planets around the same star, so now, the Kepler mission, which is renewed as a, with the name K2, is observing and has been observing uh, since December the, the field of TRAPPIST-1. And it will observe it during three months. So you will have three months of observations, continuous, that could show other planets, even if their orbits are quite large, even if they are much further from the seven planets we know, we could still have the chance to have one or a few transits that are visible in the Kepler data. The Kepler data are going to be uh, public very soon, so it's going to be very exciting to, to analyze them. And for the most Spitzer, we have more time on Spitzer to observe the system. Spitzer is observing the system right now, and we'll observe it, we'll observe uh, chunks uh, of a few hours during the next month, and it will, go, it will do this again in uh, fall, in September and October, to observe the transits of the known planet, but also search for other planets. And also, we want to detect more systems of this kind, because the largest catalog we have of terrestrial planets we can study, the more we can learn. And so, we can move now from this prototype to the main concept, which is called then Speculos. And we could convince some funder to give us the funds to, to make Speculos real, including the European Research Council that uh, gave us a grant uh, to build two one-meter telescopes we also got the grant for two other telescopes that will be installed, the four, at the Paranal Observatory, which is, uh, in my knowledge, the best site for astronomy in the southern hemisphere. And from there being installed right now, in fact, in two weeks, uh, Julia and I go to Paranal to see the installation of the first telescope and then to play with it, of course, because it's a new toy. We want to play with it. And at the end of the year, we should have the four telescope installed and searching for TRAPPIST-1 like system. And we are, also, uh, we are also progressing very well in extending the project to the northern hemisphere. We already have secured the funding for a telescope in Mexico. We got uh, last week the good news that a, seg a second telescope was, uh, the funding was secure. So we are really trying to, to get a survey that is able to observe all the nearest ultra cold dwarf stars, at least the one for which we could study an Earth-like planet and maybe detect life. Just for fun, let me show you the first two telescopes in the manufactory in Germany. They are called Hayo and Europa. I guess you will, you will guess the name of the two others, uh, which will come uh, later. And so uh, these telescopes are one meter. They are completely robotic and uh, they will be operational very, very soon. 
And here you have a nice image of the domes of the two telescopes waiting for their telescopes. They have been installed a few, a few weeks ago. And uh, in two weeks, they will get their, teles their first telescopes and the second one two months uh, later. And we will be able to start uh, searching, hunting for more systems like TRAPPIST-1. And now we want also to characterize the planet. And I will let Julien explain you what are our, our plans to study this planet and get a better understanding of these very exciting terrestrial planets. Hi. So you can hear me well? Awesome. Great. So as Michael said, the point of discovering this planet really is to search for life, so signs of habitability, signs of life up there. So how are we going to go toward this? Uh, well, the first thing is really to assess if this planet have an atmosphere. Have an atmosphere and then which type? And then we can dive, dive, dive deeper into this uh, venture with the new uh, facilities. So with our team of like wonderful international experts, we've initiated, as soon as we detected this planet, a worldwide effort ranging from the ultraviolet down to the radio. In the ultraviolet, we work with um, David Ehrenreich and Vincent Bourrier to search for what we call atmospheric escape, exosphere. The thing is, when you have a planet so close to its star, what may happen is that its atmosphere is ripped away by the solar wind. This has been done for some planets. We've worked to do so with the Hubble Space Telescope to search for this hint of exosphere because this would suggest the presence of large water reservoir around these planets. Uh, Vincent Bourrier published a paper just today, so if you go online, you can look at the very first data we obtained with the Hubble Space Telescope that show that actually the star has some signal in the ultraviolet, and we can move down this path uh, with Hubble, which is really exciting. Next to this, yeah, so I talked about this um, atmospheric loss, atmospheric escape. So the question is really for these stars, with, for these planets, which are way closer to the star, are they actually able to sustain an atmosphere? Because the X-ray and UV emission that they receive, the irradiation, is significant, it's quite high, so there is atmospheric erosion. We know that there may be replenishment mechanism, maybe a magnetosphere to help them sustain the atmosphere. So we're also looking for signs of both this effect. How can they replenish the atmosphere? Well, eventually, or maybe, through tidally induced volcanism. The system is so packed that there is a gravitational interaction between the two planets that pull each other apart, leading to what we call transit timing variations, but also, which, is, which is what we use to determine their mass. Because of the gravitational interaction, the transit that Michael showed, uh, their timing is slightly shifted before or after the time that they would, they would have if nothing was around to pull them in a direction or another. You can use that to determine the mass. But this also induces significant tide on one another, which may induce volcanism helping to replenish the, the atmosphere. Now, the fun fact about this planet is that they are so close to one another that if you were standing on the surface of them, the other planet, when they pass close to you, would be as big and, and, is, and sometimes bigger than our moon. So think about standing on a planet and looking at something that's just not white and without significant pattern like the moon, but something that actually could have massive pattern, like how it could spark your imagination. Next to this, up, there is the magnetic aspect of things. And we are fortunate to have here uh, Marie Knapp, that is leading the effort with a low-far radio telescope based in the Netherlands. We do have um, Adam Burgasser, who is a professor on the other coast, but also an MIT alumni, who is helping us with a VLA to search for signs of magnetic field, which we look for, looking at how the magnetic field interacts with um, the, poten well, the, the stellar wind interacts with the potential magnetic field of the planet. Interestingly, you can see here the comparison between the Jovian system and the Trappist-1 system, when we only knew about the three planets. And you can see how the parallel that you could make between Trappist-1b, the innermost planet, and Io, Trappist-1b would be experiencing magnetic field of the order of twice um, Io. So Trappist-1b could just be a large, scaled-up version of Io. But we don't know. We will investigate that, obviously, further. Now, 
My interest really is on the atmospheric side. And the way to search for um, atmosphere, to search for uh, molecules, as Michael said, is to go down to the infrared, where you excite the rotovibrational um, level of these molecules. And to do so, um, I use Hubble. I use Hubble with Nico Lewis at the Space Telescope Institute, and I work for it at Nata Goddard. And we use it for the very first time in May. So just two days after we published the discovery on May 2nd, we had the Hubble Space Telescope pointing towards uh, TRAPPIST-1 to pick a very, very rare, what we saw to be very rare at that point, but now we realize that double transit happened all the time there. <laughs> so there are so many planets. An event during which the two planets were passing at the same time in front of the star. And may the force it was, and the force definitely was with us, because the star, the two planets, and the telescope were perfectly aligned to provide us with this amazing data set where you do have the, the star, you have Hubble that is, well, Trappist one is Hubble that's hidden from Hubble's point of view in this shaded area, and then you have the two transit that happened right at the right time. So everything was perfectly aligned to provide us with the, fir the very first insight into the atmosphere of temperate Earth-sized planet, or actually of Earth-sized planet as a whole, that we had have again. And what it showed, it showed that the planets do not have hydrogen-dominated atmosphere, so uh, primordial hydrogen-dominated atmosphere, which will be extended, puffy, but they have something else, either volatile rich atmosphere or no atmosphere at all, but it provides us to check that box when you go down to estimating what is the extent of the atmospheric annulus. You can see here the data is shown in black so as a function of the wavelengths. You have the uh, transit depth that is relative. And you have a nice, this is what you would see if the planet had large extended atmosphere, a strong signal, a strong actually water feature in this case, due to the fact that the ring for hydrogen dominated atmosphere is really large, really puffy. If you have something else, the mean molecular mass or the density of the atmosphere is, is much higher, so the atmospheric ring is thinner, and hence the amplitude of this modulation induced by the atmosphere is much lower, as shown in blue. Great, so we check this box. These planets do not have hydrogen dominated atmosphere, which would have prevented them to be habitable, actually, so it's a good thing. So we could consider moving further. As soon as we detected uh, the new planets, we turned again to NASA and asked them to use the Hubble Space Telescope to do the exact same thing for the, two, for the, for the other planets. Uh, they responded very quickly, every single time within 24 hours, so we've been really lucky. <laughs> and we managed to observe additional uh, transit of these planets before the star passed behind uh, the sun from our point of view, so before we just couldn't observe it till May 2017. We get this beautiful data set with a transit of two planets at a time during these four different visits. And we're still processing the data, so stay tuned. We'll let you know what's happening with regard to these four additional targets, D, E, F, and G, the three last being in the habitable zone of the star. Now, where do we want to go next? As I said, the very first step is to assess if these planets are telluric, if they are not mini version of Neptunes, so making sure that they don't have this extended hydrogen-dominated atmosphere, which will make them inhabitable. This is pretty easy to do. We've done this with a few transits with Hubble. Now what we want to do is make one step towards assessing, well, determining what uh, type of atmosphere they have. And we can, what we can do with Hubble is search for water or methane-dominated atmosphere, which have a higher mean molecular mass, meaning that the atmosphere is thinner if they have such atmosphere. And our plan, yeah, you can see that the arrow here should go up. Higher mean molecular mass, mean molecular, mean molecular mass, <laughs> the more time you need to actually get the error bar, the precision of the measurements, to assess the presence of such atmosphere. We will need about 20 to 30 transit with Hubble to assess the presence of such atmosphere. So we're currently working now. Um, we've put a team together uh, with people related to other facility to put a treasury program on Hubble in order to assess the presence of such volatile rich atmosphere around this planet within the next two years. It will not only provide us with the first 
detection of molecules around Earth-sized planets, it would also be essential for us to optimize the scientific return of the James Webb Space Telescope to be launched in 2018, which will be the telescope that we will be using to assess their habitability. And this is James Webb. James Webb, as I said, will be launched in 2018 and is the facility we will use to, get, to gain in-depth insight into the atmospheric composition, temperature, and pressure of this planet. This is really the capacity we will leverage to assess the habitability of these planets. Next to James Webb, the upcoming generation of observatory include the, the extremely large telescope, which would be ground-based. With this telescope, and James Webb, we hope to move towards um, detect the detection of biosignatures within the next 10 to 20 years. So I say biosignatures, but this is really a place where we need to work. Because at this stage, it's really difficult to say what is a biosignature. And here at MIT, with Professor Seeger, Janusz, we're working, well, they are working hard on finding an answer to this question. So when we come to them, with a nice transmission spectrum, like this one, and we've identified molecules, their number density, their fraction, basically, in the atmosphere, that will help us understand, is this an actual biosignature? Is this a strong confirmation that there is a biomass there or not? Because it could also be produced by geophysical processes, for example. Now, just to provide you with a comparison between what James Webb will provide us with compared to Hubble, this is what Hubble has been provided us with, right here. So we have a much wider spec like spectral window with a much higher precision. So the opportunity to find lots of different molecules, but also compare the strengths of the signature to constrain the temperature and all these different things. That's great. This is all about finding signs of habitability, signs of life. But really, TRAPPIST-1 is way more than that. So let's make a few steps back and remember why is exoplanetary science so exciting. For hundreds of years, we've built an understanding of planets, planet formation, planetary system, based on one sample, the solar system. And then the field of exoplanetary science has provided us with lots of different perspectives. We have detected new types of planets, hot Jupiter, planet like, the, like, like Jupiter, but orbiting the star not in 11 years, but in only a few days. We've detected super-Earth, planets with sizes that range between the one of the rocky planet in our system and the ice giants, planets we were just not expected. We've detected planets with no star, free-floating in the Milky Way. We've detected planets with multiple stars. We've detected planet exotic like this one with 37 rings or so. Their stance is about 200 times the extent of Saturn's ring meaning that if Saturn had such rings, you would be able to see it by naked eye in the sky. <laughs> We've seen planets being pulled apart by the star at the very end of their life. We've really, really, really changed our perspective on planet and planet formation. And yet, all of this has been quite superficial. And the beauty of TRAPPIST-1 is that beyond providing us with this opportunity of searching for signs of habitability, signs of life, it really is the opportunity to challenge, change, revisit our understanding of planetary system. And this is why it's such a nice thing to be here at MIT in Ips, where we have people from geology, geophysicists, we have, we have everyone here to start playing with the system. The only one that we know so far that can provide us with this in-depth understanding of other planets, other planets than the one that we found in our system. Thank you. Oh, it was off all the time, actually. Oh, really? But that wasn't that interesting, right? No. <laughs> well, that was fascinating. 
Congratulations. Um, before I open up the, uh, the floor for, for Q&A, I just want you uh, all to know, and you know, you know that already, that you know, MIT, of course, would love to be uh, partners on this, uh, this exciting endeavor. Uh, we already, uh, thanks to the Heising Simons Foundation, a long way in uh, you know, becoming a member of the consortium, and hopefully we can uh, join you fully very, very, very soon. And uh, I want to make sure you're running out of names of the uh, <laughs> satellites of Jupiter for, for names of these uh, satellites. Uh, so if you want to help us out on that, uh, you know, you're welcome and uh, come and see me. So with that, uh, I would like to open the floor for uh, questions for uh, Michael or uh, Julien. Yeah. This is an M-class star. Are there no gas giants in M-class stars? Uh, for what we know, the, the, the M-class dwarf. Okay, so, so the question is, uh, uh, is the star uh, M-class dwarf? And yes, it is. M dwarf, is a, it is a, a spectral uh, classification which, uh, which uh, tells us that it's a, a very cool star, in fact. It is related to the temperature. And the other part of the question is, do uh, M dwarfs form giant planets? In fact, they rarely do. And especially this kind of super low mass M dwarfs that are called ultra cool dwarfs, uh, we do, do have no example of a giant planet formed around them. And it's not surprising because we know that when they form, they are surrounded by a very small, what is called protoplanetary disk composed of dust and gas in which a planet form. But compared to the one of a solar type star, it's really, really uh, smaller and with much less mass and not enough mass to form a giant planet. So we're not surprised we don't find giant planets around them. You spoke about all the tidal forces that, that occur because of all the planets are so closely packed together in the solar system. Do you have any sort of intuitions or insights about whether that would favor life or disfavor life on those planets? Uh, the, the fate of the, of the planets with the tidal interaction? Yeah, I mean, the, so you said that there are strong tidal forces because the planets are so close together. Do yeah. you have any kind of insight as to whether that would sort of favor the presence of life or disfavor it, or would it be uh, it's, it's, well, it's very difficult, and I would say what is great here is that the observations will answer us about the, the, these kind of questions. Because from a theoretical point of view, you can expect everything. The star emits a lot of X-ray and UV, which could or not erode very quickly the atmosphere. And volcanism induced by tidal heating, by tidal forces, could also replenish the atmosphere. So we can by playing with these two toys and by adding other toys like impacts and so on, ingredients, you can make it anything you want uh, for these planets. So I can't answer you, but what is great is that we could maybe answer you uh, very soon with thanks to the uh, observational opportunity brought by this system. Okay, and one other thing is that we don't have just one, right? We kind of have like seven, so <laughs> let's just see. We have seven chances to, to answer that question, so that's good. I'll take your question, but uh, because of the very bright light, it feels like this. <laughs> yes, <laughs> use a corona <laughs> it's, you, it's very hard for me to, uh, to see you, so I see a few in the, in the front, but if you sit, sit in the back, they all ask questions, just to shout out. On the uh, <coughs> lot of planets, so I guess the closer ones, is it possible for them to have a, uh, an atmosphere uh, that can well enough, uh, you know, sustain life on the dark side? If, you know, uh, so the, the tidal locking is not demonstrated. Huh? It is just uh, something that is likely from a theoretical point of view. But theories can be wrong when they are not tested uh, for when they are not uh, tested on observations. But if they are tidally locked, indeed, you could have a, a gradient of temperature and to have a very cold site, very uh, uh, hot uh, day site. But it really depends on the atmospheric properties. If you put uh, uh, you assume an Earth-like atmosphere, the redistribution of heat uh, from the day side to the night side will be quite efficient. So it will be a, a bit colder uh, on, the day, on the night side, but it won't uh, preclude habitable condition at all. But if there's no atmosphere, or nearly no atmosphere, it's different. But with no atmosphere, no habitable condition, so. Can you help me understand the scale of the Trappist system? How does the distance from Trappist E to Trappist F, F 
compared to the distance from Earth to our moon? It's 5%. Well, that's 5%. So it's super, super compact. And I would like also to add, I didn't uh, uh, mention it, that, is that the planets have a very uh, special configuration. The orbital periods are related by ratios of integral numbers. We call this resonances. And uh, this, this indicates, if we believe the theory, that this planet formed further out, more probably, and migrated inwards, making a, being trapped in these resonances and making a kind of train, the train of planets migrating inwards and deciding, oh, let's stop here because they are, it is the habitable zone and, uh, or not. <laughs> so this is, this is what uh, these configurations tell us. And it's a very interesting configuration which reminds us of the Jupiter uh, system, uh, by example in which we have Io, Europa, and Ganymede, which are also related, in, in, which are also in a, a, such a system of uh, resonance, of, uh, of uh, complex dynamical interactions. So you're blowing my mind. Are you saying that our moon is 20 times further away than the Earth? The moon? Our moon is Our moon is, uh, it's, it is at uh, 384,000 kilometers from the Earth. And the typical distances between the planet and the, and the system here is a few times the distance to the moon, five to 10 times. So with an Apollo mission, you could go from one planet to the other. Hi, I have a question. I think it's mostly for Julien. Uh, can you sp is, like, expand a bit better as for why, or a bit long, rather a bit you know, longer, <laughs> as for why uh, this system in particular would uh, allow us to revise our understanding of planetary system. I mean, it's a very special one. It's very compact. So what does it add? Yeah, OK. So, Thank you. so the beauty of the system really is that it's, it is the only one with so many planets that can be studied in great depths. You can study them you know, from the UV to radio, but in particular in the infrared, where you can, um, well, you can get their mass with very high precision. You can assess their atmospheric composition, temperature, and these are planets that you can see in great depths that formed around the same star. So it's basically like a Rosetta Stone with seven different languages, each language related to these different planets. And they are telling the same story, but in, you know, with these different languages. So this is what we have here. This is an amazing Rosetta Stone that will provide us with one narrative, the story of their formation and evolution around one star. And we have the capabilities to actually transcribe these languages owing to the upcoming facility. And this is the very the first time, is this was the first time, there is no system like it. And it's gonna be difficult to find another one that will provide us with such in-depth insight. And that is why this one can provide us with this perspective shift from the perspective we've had for centuries that led to our understanding of planetary science. Uh, difficult to find another one. We're gonna try still, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so you said this is a, quite a young star. Um, and so is it still contracting and cooling? And would the habitable zone actually um, basically mean like planet G would actually fall out of the habitable zone? And how, how long would that take? We're uh, 100 or let's say 99.99% certain this star is what is on what is called the main sequence. So it is no more evolving, especially this kind of ultra cool dwarfs. When they are on this, when they are uh, older than 500 million years, like we think it is the case here, they, they remain like this nearly forever. So the habitable zone in 100 billion years will still be the same, I think. OK, one thing that we may want to emphasize here is that uh, we have no idea about the age of the system, right? Yep. It's very difficult to constrain the age of such star. So or I, I, we think that it has at least 500 million years, but it can have 5, 10. <laughs> this is a big question mark. So that is something that we would have to move forward with, trying to find ways to really constrain the age of the star. More questions from on the left. Oh. Sorry, not a physicist, not an engineer, a designer. But I really liked why you said, uh, when you said that you took shortcut, right, how you were trying to re-question the hypothesis of how 
the planet going behind and the light changing. And how did you question that? Like, how did you break the existing concepts and theories of looking at planets and said, hey, this is the way to look at it? What inspired you to look at it from that uh, perspective? So what, what inspired me to, to look at this kind of system? Yeah, what, what made you take that shortcut, right, of not looking at it traditionally how it was looked at for such a long time uh, to find planets? Well, these systems have been, uh, I don't know if I'm sure, I'm not sure I understand the question, but these systems have been quite overlooked just because also they are very difficult to search for planets around them. And uh, also because the main interest was, and I think is, is still in the community, to search for Earth twins. Earth twins uh, are around solar type stars, sun-like stars. So, so my question was like, how did you come up with the hypothesis of looking at like how the light is getting dimmer? or darker, like when the planet's passing the star? Oh, I, I didn't invent this. Huh? This is a technique that is uh, very well uh, No, known. no, I know this is a technique, but how did you think about applying it to the current Be study? Because it's the most promising technique in terms of detecting Earth-sized planets around this type of stars, just because the contrast in size is so favorable. There are other techniques to detect exoplanets, like direct imaging, but it's around this kind of star, as the, the planets are very close to the star, it's super difficult. It's a worst case scenario. Uh, there, are, there is a radial velocity method, which is a, a method that allows the detection of the first exoplanet around a solar type star, but also it's not yet ready to, to detect this kind of planets. So it is really the transit method that was offering the more perspective, promises, and also in terms of characterization. If, it, if there's no transit, like in the case of, for instance, Proxima Centauri, which was detected last year in radial velocity, we think it does not transit. We are limited in our capacity to study the planet. So it was really this will to be able to say something about the planet. Uh, thank you. In, in terms of the characterization, um, uh, understand maybe from what you talked that uh, you're subtracting uh, here. The, the, yeah. Yeah. I was looking for. Yeah. <laughs> uh, are you subtracting the spectrum, basically, of the normal, uh, when there is no transit, from the spectrum that you see when there is a transit to understand and characterize? And uh, my question is, if this is what you're doing, is this like a second benefit of looking at, at the ultra-cool, dimmer star? And not only the size benefit, the factor of 100 that you spoke of, in terms of uh, improvement in the ability to see the, the signal in the noise, but do you also get an improvement in the signal-to-noise ratio by, because you're looking at, at the dimmer star? So when you're subtracting the spectrum, you get a benefit there? Is, is there a... I will add the expert and who is leading the effort uh, of this uh, atmospheric study, Julien, answer. Yeah, so it's, it's actually the other way around. The signal-to-noise ratio is, is not better by 100 because the star is, is fainter. So, the signal is boosted by about um, a factor of 100, that's true. But then in terms of signal to noise ratio, so how easy it is to study these planets, it's about a factor of three of what it would be around uh, M0 and, and others, so J star, et cetera. So it, it, it is still a significant boost. It's a factor of three. So in terms of time that you need to invest, it's basically 10, ten times less because it, there's a square that goes for the time that you need to invest. So it is way easier to play with this kind of planet. And that's why Mikael pushed, well, made this bold move that is playing with this prototype um, and is providing us with targets that we can play with with upcoming facilities. Because the one that we will find, the other Earth-sized planet, if we find any, it will be really tricky to play with. Um, so. uh, I would add that uh, another advantage here is that the transit happens all the time. Yeah. So for an Earth, you have to accumulate plenty of transit to, to study the atmosphere, and whatever the star. But here, accumulating many transit is easy because they come every one day, two day. Uh, for an Earth, it would be every year. So. You have to live very long and very old to be very old to, to get the, the final answer. When you consider the uh, time frame from 1995 to now, and you look at the speed of the technology advancing, do you think it's possible to, do you have an idea when you might step from finding potentially inhabitable planets to finding planets that have perhaps an active environment, and, and then the sci-fi part of the question, what do you think would be the level of discovery that would actually change our behavior here on Earth? <laughs> uh, that, pardon the sci-fi part of that. Okay. Do you want to hmm? 
Sure. Uh, well, with regards to the behavior, one fun thing is, uh, so we've been playing with, interacting with quite a few journalists, especially Michael, Michael right? Uh, and quite a few people have been really happy to have this nice news to talk about. You know, it's been like somehow dark times. And this has been, you know, the Google Doodle and all these things have actually brought some, some light spirit and, and happiness. Like there's, we've been using this hashtag make people dream again, you know, and that's a good thing. With this kind of discovery, you can, you can just take some distance and go back to what actually matters, what inspires you, what makes you dream. Uh, so this is already one nice step forward in that direction. Um, hopefully, within the next two years, we're going to find signs of water with Hubble. So something that is good to keep in mind for NASA is that there is no pain, no gain. Spitzer's people have invested 1,000 hours, 500 now and 500 in the years to come, to come to that point, to come to this nice discovery. If we want to do the same thing with Hubble Space Telescope, we need to invest the same amount of time. The amazing discovery we had with Hubble are based on only six hours of observation. And the amount of time that we use with Spitzer is the amount of time we need to find water signature if they have volatile rich atmosphere. So that's what needs to be done. And this would be already another wave of excitement. The uh, final, I mean, the next step forward would be assessing the habitability and hopefully identify one as habitable. We hope to do that within the next five years or so, 10-ish year. And then if they are habitable and if some actually have biosignatures, well, that's tricky because we don't really know what is a biosignature, and hence we, we can't really say within X years we'll do it. But we hope that within the next generation, we'll have done that. And at that point, we will really brought our conscientiousness level somehow to a completely different place. We'll see our pale blue dot as something completely different. We'll have a new perspective on life, habitats, ideally, a different perspective on what we are as a species, our role on this earth as conscious being. And that's, that's I think, a huge step forward for, for a species. So let's see where we go with that. I think you have a new Carl Sagan here. Exactly. <laughs> 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 So it's still very difficult to, uh, to find water. Um, I know where to find wine, beer, and other drinks. Great. And so I invite you all to uh, come to the ninth floor, where we have a reception. Oh, yeah, there's, there's something. Uh, if you want to keep in touch with, with everything that's been done here, uh, we put together back in May a website that's really easy. It's trappist.one. And you'll find all the media, beautiful, uh, for, for children, there is also Amory Trio. We put together really nice, um, how do you call this, uh, drawings to explain what is the next planet, how we can study it. You'll find everything on that website, which is a, a wonderful platform to keep in touch with our research. So thanks. Great, thank you. Thank you very much.